Jesus set me free. Don't you love that? You ever wonder what he set you free from? I mean, the need for freedom kind of connotes that you're in slavery if you're not free, right? How many, how many of you guys like the idea of being a slave? <laughs> to, to him, yeah. But the concept of slavery is something that's pretty lost on our society because we don't, you know, we had slavery 200 years ago, but we don't, we don't have any slavery right now. Can y'all hear me back there? I'm going to adjust that volume just a little. Is that it? How's that? Better? Okay. I mean, I can talk a lot louder if I need to. So we've been talking about the laws that God writes on our minds and puts in our heart based on his promises in the new covenant. His new covenant is basically that he would write his laws on our mind, put it in our heart, and take our sins and lawless deeds and remember them no more. So we read that, we're going, that's cool, but what laws does he actually write on our heart? So we started this uh, several weeks ago. The first law, of course, is the law of love. I mean, that's the greatest commandment, right? That, that is a law he gave. He said, I give you a new commandment. And last week, we talked about the law of faith. I mean, without faith, it's impossible to please, and we receive nothing from God without belief. Well, today we're going to talk about the law of liberty, because Jesus did set us free from something. And we're going to talk today about what we are set free from as Christians. You know, this, uh, this great experiment that we call America is based on the concept of freedom. I mean, the whole, that's why the whole Declaration of Independence was written about. All the bondages that were imposed, the tyranny that was imposed by the King of England on the 13 colonies. And in that declaration, they, they reference the, what they call the laws of nature and the laws of God. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Liberty is core to what we desire. We are made to want to be free. The problem is man is prone to enslave other men. That's the, that's the fallen nature that wants to, to bind up other people and make them subjugated. It's called slavery. Slavery to someone else. But here's what Jesus said. In John 8, 36, he made a very simple proclamation. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. So what did he mean? And why is freedom so important to believers? Well, it, it's obvious. We desire to be free from sin. I mean, the very reason that Jesus was so attracted to us is because we knew we were bound up in our sin and we were, we were miserable. And the thing about it is we, we need to understand that sin enslaves everybody. I mean, because of the fall of Adam and Eve, sin was infused into our DNA. We are born into sin and we're a slave to it. And without God, we're bound to obey sin. Sin holds man hostage. What, what enables sin to enslave us? I mean, how, how, how do we become a slave to sin? Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5.56, he said, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. What? Yeah. Remember how Paul explained the law? He said um, the law reveals sin and it ends up being empowered in us when it is revealed to us. Paul said the law says don't covet. He said when the law said don't covet, I would have known not to covet had the law not said don't covet. That's how the law is the power of sin is the law tells us where we fall short. See, the law of God, the, the Ten Commandments, they are the, they're an expression of the absolute perfection of God. And when we, when we evaluate that in light of our being, what we discover is that we fail on every front. Even if you don't physically pick up an axe and kill somebody, sometimes we have malice in our heart. And Jesus said when you have, he, he said this, he said, the law says don't kill. If you kill somebody, you committed murder. But he said, I tell you, if you have, if you have anger in your heart against a brother, you're at risk of judgment. So he's saying, man, the law is exacting in every way. 
And when we try to keep it, we fail. And so what we realize is the saw, the law reveals our sin. It is the empowerment of sin. Or it empowers sin. And we know what the result of sin is, right? God, he, Paul also wrote this very interesting statement in Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. You know, either he's using improper English or we misunderstand what he's saying. Because wouldn't we say the law the, 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 the wages of sins is death? But see, in the eyes of a holy God, anything but, it, but total rightness, total righteousness is a choice of either choosing God or not choosing God. The only life in the universe is God. And so if we reject God because we choose sin, what we've chosen is not God. We've chosen death. The wages of sin is death. There's no option. There's no middle ground. It is a zero-sum game. And I mean, the law is so exacting. James wrote in James 2.10, For whoever shall keep the law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of the whole thing. Man, that's exacting. You blow it once, you've blown it forever. And the sad part about it is, we're all guilty. Breaking one small aspect of the law brings about the effects of sin, guilt, condemnation, judgment, and eventually death. See, God wants us free from that. In fact, we read in Revelations, he said, the last enemy to be thrown into the lake of fire is death. God hates the result of sin. He hates death. Why? Because he's life. It's his enemy. So he doesn't want us being subject to his enemy. So the way he works it out sometimes looks like we're set up for failure because he tells us what is the right thing to do and then we try to do it and we fail. So we found ourselves becoming even more enslaved in sin, it seems. How, do, how does he get us out of that? Well, the first thing he does is that when we accept Jesus into our heart, we become a new creature, a new creation. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I've said this before. Christianity is not a badge we wear. Christianity is a state of being. We are changed. When you're born again, you are not the same and never will be the same person. You've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And, in, and we have our life in Christ and he lives in us. Praise God. And you can't work your way out of that. Any more you, than you can work your way into perfection, you can't. You can't work your way out of His salvation in your life because you're changed, you're new. And on top of that, he says in Ezekiel 36, 30, 26, he says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. What was written on stone? The law. What was written on our heart? A new law. These laws we're talking about. He gives us a heart of flesh and he writes the law on that. We even get a new body later. <laughs> well, this doesn't look forward. 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 53 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Praise God. I'm looking forward to flying around heaven. I really am. I'm, that's got to be fun. That's called immortality. But until immortality comes, we've got to live in this mortal body. And that's where it seems like it catches us. Because a conflict arises. This conflict between the flesh, what Paul calls the flesh, our, carna our carnality, and our new heart and spirit. Paul elaborated on this conflict pretty, in pretty much detail. Listen to this in Romans 7, 15 through 25. For what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I will do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. I then, I do, if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do I do not do, but the evil I will not do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, 
It is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that is evil, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into the captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Now, we're going to unpack this because that can be really confusing, what he just said. I want to, I want to, I want to do right, but I don't do right. And the things that I should do, I don't do. And the things I shouldn't do, I find myself doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. Where do I get the strength to deal with this? Well, I want to make something very clear. And I think this is confusing in Christendom. Paul is not talking about a, a, a warfare between your old nature and your new nature. Because you don't have the old nature anymore. When you are born into Christ, you have a new heart, a new mind, you're going to get a new body. But what happens is we don't forget our old nature. And, and we find that we remember some of those things that used to be tempting and allure us. And sometimes we give in to the recollection of that old nature, and that's called giving in to sin. So we find ourselves even doing that, but one of the things we're going to discover is we don't have to anymore. Paul even wrote this. He, you know, this, this, this battle he's talking about is a battle in the mind. Our spirit, our heart doesn't want to do those things, but in our mind we find that we want to. We think about them and we want to do them. He even went so far as to write over in Romans 8, 7 that the, the carnal, carnality, the flesh, is in, enmity with God. It's an absolute enemy of God because it's the, a thinking of an old man, a man without Christ. And Paul recognized that agonizing internal warfare that we all experience. We want to do good, we don't do it. We, want to, we don't want to do something bad, we find ourselves doing that. I mean, what compels us to do that? Well, there's a reality we got to face. There is no good thing in the flesh. You're never going to be able to reconcile old recollections of the old nature with the new nature because they are at enmity. They are opposite of that. That's why we can't stop sinning by our own strength. We don't have the capacity to do that. We cannot perfect the flesh. You know, I mean, that's, it's, like, it's like dancing with a cadaver. That, that old man is dead. So it seems we're hopeless, doesn't it? That's why Paul declared, oh, wretched man that I am. This thing's confusing and it's hard and it, it seems def that we're defeated. But in the very next verse, he gives the solution. The very next chapter, Romans 8, 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, there is now... No condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. Praise God. The condemnation that comes from the, 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 the law of sin, we don't face anymore. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Praise God. That means that we are no longer a slave to sin. He set us free. Man, it's hard to remember that when we find ourselves tempted by sin, though, isn't it? So, we have this struggle. See, the Lord revealed to Paul that the only mastery over sin and our fleshly, carnal, carnal thinking of what used to tempt us is, the, is not, not doing that is the freedom that we have in Christ. He freed us from that slavery. See, he did it this way. Because Jesus was sinless, the penalty for sin could not bind him. What's the penalty of sin? The wages of sin? Death. Did Jesus die? Yeah. But did he die because he sinned? No. Death couldn't hold him, therefore. Because the, if the wages of sin, if the penalty for sin is death, and he didn't sin even though he died, death could not hold him. Death had no legal authority to keep Jesus dead. There he 
resurrected, and he conquered death, hell, and the grave in that resurrection. We're going to be coming up on Easter here in a few weeks, and we're going to be talking a lot about that because that is the most incredible thing God can ever pull off. Jesus even said that. He said to the disciples when they came back marveling that even the devils were subject to them. He said, don't marvel at that. You marvel at your name's written in heaven. That's a big one. So Jesus conquered death and its facilitator, sin. So we're freed from that slavery of sin and the consequences of it because he imputed his righteousness to us and therefore we shared in his resurrection. Death couldn't hold us either because we're no longer condemned for sin. For by dying on our behalf, he purchased us with his blood. See, they had a slave market where you could go and with money purchase slaves. We were slaves to sin. Jesus died, and the only price that would pay the price for our sin is death. Well, he died in our stead, and in his blood, by shedding it for us, he purchased us from the slavery of sin for himself. That's why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6.20, For you were bought with a price. You were bought. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You don't even belong to yourself anymore. And you sure don't belong to sin. We are his property now. We're his slave. If you're going to be a slave to somebody, I'd rather it be a God who loves me. So just as he set his chosen people free, the Hebrews, from captivity in Egypt, Jesus sets us free from the accusation, the condemnation, and the judgment of sin. Sets us free. Those he purchased, he sets free. He bought us from the slave market, and he said, now here's your freedom. You were a slave to sin, now I bought you for a price. They, sin is no longer your slave master, now I'm going to set you free. Praise God, every slave wanted to be free. Jesus did exactly that. But see, we become slaves of another. And this is the cool part. Romans six eighteen, Paul writes, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin... Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Praise God. And you know what that means? It doesn't mean slaves of doing right. It means slaves of what He did right that's imputed to us. All the benefits of that. Jesus set us free from sin to be slaves of righteousness. How so? 2 Corinthians 5.21, I say this, I think, every time I speak, he who knew no sin became sin so we could be the righteousness of God. That's why he did that. Yet the battle rages in our minds still. What gives? Our new spirit and heart want to please God. Our recollection of the old nature rages against that. And it can be persuasive. That's sometimes why we give in to it. And you all know it. Well, our sin is a mile wide and an inch deep, isn't it? It's got no meaning. What's the old saying? It takes you farther than you're willing to go. You stay there longer than you want to, and it costs you more than you're willing to pay. And when we sense that conflict, there's a natural tendency to want to fight against it by doing right. And that's exactly where it catches us because we find ourselves sinning the more we think about sin. And God, when you sin in your life, you think you're tempted by certain things, the natural compunction is, I gotta stop doing that. I gotta stop doing that. I gotta start doing this. I gotta start doing that. And the more you think about it, the more tempting it gets, and before long you find yourself doing it. The alcoholic call that recovering alcoholics call that falling off the wagon. Because <laughs> they're trying to do it in their own strength. The more we strive to attain perfection by trying to keep God's law, the more sin takes hold of us. And rather than not sinning, we find ourselves sinning more and more. Why? Why does that happen? Because when we try to fight it in our own strength, we lose and sin continues to have mastery over our lives, even though he set us free. Because we're trying to set ourselves free. And we're not reminding ourselves that he, he completely 
set us free forever. I mean, you can open a gate of a cage, a caged animal, and try to usher him out, but you, you've all seen and heard the stories where sometimes those caged animals are, are captive so long, they don't know what freedom is, even with the door open. They choose to stay in the cage. And I think that's what happens to us sometimes. We don't remember that we're free. We're not reminded that we're free. We don't remind ourselves that we're free. And so we fall into the lie that we are bound by sin. And we are not. Paul wrote, I mean, you should read Romans 6 through 8. It's an amazing story about how to deal with this. When this battle, he says in Romans 6, 16, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave who you obey? Whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. What is he saying here? Because we're set free, we can choose to be free. Or we can choose to go back to old ways that we remember that we're no longer that we have that nature, but we remember that nature. And so we find ourselves giving in to temptation by it. But we don't have to because we're free. So how do you deal with this? This battle that rages in our minds, our spirits, our hearts, they want to serve God. Our minds are like, no, no, you want to go do this. How do we deal with this if we, if we know that Jesus set us free from the slave mastery of sin? How do we deal with this? Well, thank goodness the Bible gives us a solution. Paul wrote this. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is he saying? The way we deal with this battle that rages in our mind is to renew the way we think about this thing. And that renewal is to stay focused on Jesus and what he did and not focusing on the things that we try to do that we could never do, and it was the reason Jesus came and died, is to overcome sin and rectify us, reconcile us back to himself. What Paul's saying is that the way we walk in the Spirit is not by efforts of the flesh. It's not by our own actions. The battle is in our minds. And so he tells us you need to constantly be renewing your mind, focusing on who we are in Christ. We are his. He's our master. He's our, he's our, he is the one who purchased us from the slavery of sin. We've got to continually remind ourselves of that because we're continually allowing ourselves to be tempted by a nature we no longer have. So we need to remember, we are purchased. We are forgiven. We are justified. We are beloved and we're adopted. You get in the habit of doing this. When you're brushing your teeth in the morning and look in the mirror, just say, you know, you're the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. That'll set your mind thinking in the right direction because that's exactly what you are. You are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. He didn't just wash us clean with his blood and then we go out and sully ourselves again and suddenly we're a sinner again. You're not a sinner. You are a child of God. You were a sinner before you knew him. He cleansed you from that. One of my favorite verses is in 2 Corinthians 3.18. Paul had just talked about how when the law is read, when people try to live under the law, there's a veil over their face and they can't see Christ. He said only when somebody comes to Christ is that veil lifted. What's the veil? The veil is the law that tells us we have to keep the law to please God. If we could do that, Jesus didn't need to come. But Jesus did come. He fulfilled the law. But then he nailed it to the cross and he imputed all of the effects of obedience of keeping the law to us. And so when we see him instead of the law, we're not blinded to his grace. We're not blinded to the fact that he gave us unmerited favor and saved us. 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. What is he saying? He said, we're not changed when we look at sin, we don't change when we ruminate over the sin that's in our life. We change when we focus on Jesus and when we stay focused on Jesus who Colossians tells us is the perfect image of the invisible God. 
the Holy Spirit changes us into his image. Praise God. So what's the solution? What's this battle raging in our mind? How do we deal with that? We focus on Jesus. And when we focus on Jesus, the Holy Spirit changes us and gives us a desire to want Him more and more. So we focus on Jesus more and more. We find ourselves sinning less and less because we want to be with Him. So this word transform, you know, be be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And in this verse, that we are transformed into the same image. That's the same word, transformed. It's the way it comes from the Greek word metamorphoso. It is a supernatural transition from an external source. Meaning we can't, we can't transform ourselves. We can only be transformed when we're focused on the one who can transform us, Jesus Christ. It's not by our efforts. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit when we stay focused on Jesus. So, you know, what what is this state of slavery to sin that we find ourselves thinking about so much sometimes? Most slaves didn't want to be slaves. Would you agree with that? None of us want to be. Did did anybody raise their hand? Does anybody want to be a slave? No. I mean, not in that sense. But you know what? A slave was a slave whether they wanted to be or not. Most slaves didn't want to be in bondage, but that didn't change the fact that they were still slaves. Many might not have even been good slaves. Most probably weren't really. They didn't want to be. They did the bare minimum to keep from getting beaten and maybe to get a meal every day or a a bed to have at, at night. See, the status of a slave is a state of being. It's not a choice. The point is this. If you were in the state of a slavery to sin, you couldn't choose, you couldn't action your way out of it. You were still in a state of slavery. But when you were purchased from that slave market, from the slave master of sin, you were translated into a different state of being. You were free. A slave is the property of his master, right? You're commanded to obey whatever your slave master says. And slaves mastered very. Some were could be very cruel. Others might have been kind. Sin was a brutal taskmaster. Brutal. It entices with all manners of devices that please the senses. Pride. Beauty, riches, power, status, celebrity, association, all those things are enticement. Enticement like that, it's an elixir that can make us drunk with pleasure and miserable in sin. Think about this. We discover the effects of sin after great harm to us. It allures and its charm is nothing more than a thin facade that just entices us and then leaves us as a jilted lover. Sin rapes, pillages without compassion or remorse, and then it abandons us in our shame, in our heartache, in our guilt, in our condemnation. That's the effects of slavery to sin. And listen to this. Even if a slave was a good slave, he's still a slave. Action didn't determine his slavery. He was in the state of slavery. And think about it. Although we may be not good at doing right, just like some slaves were not good at being slaves, it didn't change the fact that they were slaves. They were slaves of righteousness. And even when we find ourselves maybe not doing the right things, that didn't change our status at all. Because our status wasn't decided by our conduct. Our status was decided by his conduct. We just accepted it. That ought to be, that ought to be liberating in your thinking. Is it, you know, you wake up one of those days, everything you say seems wrong, every action you take seems wrong, you can still look in the mirror and say, you are just as much the righteousness of God today as you were yesterday. That is encouraging. And it's liberating. Because we're in a state of slavery to Jesus' righteousness. We have right standing with God and in His eyes. We're blameless. 
So we have his unconditional love. We have the fullness of his life. We abound in his peace. We're enabled with his joy. And we receive and revel in his undeserved favor. Praise God. He doles out goodness to us in unlimited supply. Those are the kind of things that our mind needs to be focused on, not our sin. Think about this. A slave may try to run away to his old master. Yet the new master still owns owns him, right? Just because the slave runs away doesn't change their status. It doesn't change their honor. See, a believer may go back to trying to keep the law and fall into the misery of being conquered by sin. But thanks to God that in His mercy, just like going and finding the sheep that got lost, He comes and gets us and brings us back and focuses on Jesus and lets us know that we are forgiven. Man, why would anybody want to interpret that as some sort of license to sin? He shows us that kind of goodness. It seems to me like we would want more and more of that kind of goodness, not the absence of it. Even when we feel the urge to sin, we can fix our focus on Jesus and His Holy Spirit empowers us to desire His better way. That liberty that He won on our behalf and rendered sin powerless in our life because we're set free from the law of sin and death and now we walk in the law of liberty. We should, we can, that's the way He set it up. So how do we do it? How do we walk in liberty, in his freedom? In Galatians 5.1, Paul wrote, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What was the yoke of the bondage? The burden of the law, trying to keep the law, trying to do something by our conduct that we think is going to please God enough to somehow justify us in his presence. Nothing we can do will justify us in the presence of that holy God except to accept what Jesus did that justified him. See, in Galatians, Paul points out that Hagar, remember Hagar? Hagar was a concubine of Sarah, Abraham's wife. She was a slave woman to Abraham and Sarah. And after God promised Abraham a son, Sarah tried to bring that promise about by giving Hagar to Abraham. And the result of that union was Ishmael. Uh Aha! There, we brought about God's promise, except God didn't agree with that. And Paul says that according uh, that the Hagar represents the bondage of the law, man's efforts to bring about God's will by doing something. Sarah, on the other hand, he called the free woman. God blessed her barren womb. She conceived Isaac, the son of promise. See, God brought about his very promise despite their efforts to bring it about in other ways. But he did it as a gift. There were no actions involved. Ishmael was not the heir of the promise God made to Abraham. In fact, Abraham later exiled Ishmael and Hagar so there would be no confusion about who the son was. God banishes sin from our life so there's no confusion who our master is. He's our master, not sin. So since our faith makes us spiritual children of Abraham, we're therefore not children of the bondwoman Hagar. We are children of the promise. Praise God. We're freed by Jesus. And we're freed from works to think that that's what God requires. James said this in in James 1.25. He said, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Wait a minute, is he saying exactly what opposite I'm saying? No, he's not. He's saying the doing here is not our works. The doing is focusing on the finished works of Jesus Christ. That's the work we do. We focus on what he's done. It isn't Jesus 99% and us 1%, guys. It isn't Jesus this much and we've got to make up the difference. It's Jesus 100% and then I'm tagging along for the ride by his grace. I do nothing to justify myself before God. Remember, this is really important. I'm about to wrap this up. I think this is really important to hear. Remember the messages to the churches in Revelations. The very first church was a church at Ephesus. Here's what Jesus said. Revelations 2, 4 through 5. Nevertheless, I have this against you. 
that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What did, he, what did he require them to repent of? It wasn't because they weren't doing good works. He had just, he'd given them incredible accolades about their work. He said, you, you, you're a hard worker, you patiently endure, you don't tolerate the evil people and say they're apostles, but they're not, but they're false teachers. I mean, he gave them accolades. There's not a church in America that wouldn't want to hear God say that about them. And yet what happens is Jesus is saying, you know what, though? You started focusing on the works. For the, for the one you're doing it for, rather than focusing on the one you're doing it for, your first love. How did they come to him? They didn't come to him by doing good works. When Paul came back through on his missionary journey to Ephesus and he called the elders together, he didn't say, you were saved by your works. He told them, he said, I preach nothing among you except the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ. It was God's mercy and God's grace that drew them. That was their first love. He was their first love. And the Lord's saying, you know what? You're getting enamored with all the doing for me, but you're not enamored with me anymore. And if you don't repent and remember, remember that and repent of it, I'm going to remove your candlestick. Now remember, the candlestick was the anointing on the church. And I'll tell you, the church at Ephesus was, it was the epicenter of Christendom in the first century. Paul founded it, Timothy bishoped it. John bishop it. Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos, they all went through there. I mean, anybody that was anybody in Christendom probably ended up going through Ephesus at one time or another. What, where's that mega church today? It's not there. The church at Ephesus is in ruins. What happened? Their candlestick got removed. Apparently, they didn't remember. They never ultimately repented to return to Jesus and stay focused on Him. They forsook their first love. They forsook their new master and returned to the old master of the law. Their works became tinkling brass and sounding cymbals. They were meaningless, useless efforts. Now listen, you need to be certain about something. Jesus' threat wasn't a, an issue of you know, punishment. What He's saying is, the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes when you focus on Jesus. When you're not focused on Jesus, you've forsaken that anointing. So when they quit focusing on Jesus, the anointing on the church went with the, for, the forsaking. Suddenly the church just dries up and dies because there was no anointing there. That's what happened to Ephesus. So God is not interested in our works motivated by a desire to present our goodness to Him. You hear that? God is not interested in our works motivated by a desire to present our goodness to Him. He just wants us to believe His goodness toward us. See, He's interested in our trusting His Son who already fulfilled the law, who bought us with His blood and gave His righteousness to us. To love God is to trust the finished works of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said in John 6, 40, This is the will of the Father. And it wasn't a to-do list. He said, you just look to the Son. And in Him, I'll give eternal life. And I'll raise Him up at the last day. Praise God. That's what we're supposed to do? That's the work? Yeah. And you know what we find? We find that when we were focused on Him, we get so enamored with His love, so filled with His love, that we just can't help but to radiate at others. That will inspire works more than any sense of duty. And oftentimes we don't even know we're doing good works because all we're doing is loving God and letting us, let, you know, loving other people with that love. It's the coolest thing. And once we understand that Christ's works are finished in us and doing, good, doing our good works are not conditional to peace and right standing with God, the concept of works takes on a whole totally different meaning. Works for Christ are no longer a drudgery, no longer a duty. You just become less introspective. You start thinking about him more. Start thinking about other people more. We don't work for the hope of justifying ourselves to gain right standing with God. We just simply work without fear, knowing he loves us. Working without fear. Right? He didn't give us, he, Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, God didn't give us a spirit of fear. He gave us a spirit of sound mind and strength and love. 
All of his thoughts toward us are good. <laughs> They're good. They're not evil. All of them. But you see, sooner or later in this process, we learn that our sin, I mean the composite of all of man's sin, past, present, and future, is nothing but a speck in the comprehensive ocean of God's grace. Man, that is liberating. God dealt with sin. Why do we keep struggling with it? Somebody who has already defeated it. So when we fail, we have the know, freedom of knowing our advocate Jesus Christ our Lord justifies us to the Father by the reason of His conquest over sin. So we focus on the finisher of the works that justify us rather than our own imperfect works. For in that we remember that we're forgiven. I mean, if there's one message Christians need to hear, you're forgiven. You are forgiven forever. I will take their sins and lawless deeds. I will remember them no more. Do we believe God? Because that's what He says He does with it. And what happens is, when that happens, we understand that we don't resist the Holy Spirit wanting to do anything in our life because we know all of His intents are good for us. Works become inspired rather than begrudged duties. So my point is, our focus should neither be on sin nor on our works. Our focus should be on Jesus. It's that simple. When we make Him the object of our focus rather than the struggle with sin, we can disregard sin's allure and just simply rest in the love of God. Man, that seems easy. And it is, if, if, if you will renew your mind about that. So we can do, we, we, we rest in His love, we revel in that. We reflect His love back to Him, we radiate it to others. So when we walk in this law of liberty, we are free from sin, we're free from condemnation and guilt, we're free to be loved, and we're free to love. Praise God. It is for freedom that He set us free. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for this liberty. It is amazing to know that you have done all the work already, that we, this is not a battle that's going to happen, and we wonder in the dicey thoughts, are we going to bring with this thing or lose this thing? You've already won. Help us to walk in your victory and rest in it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.